Hey everybody, so glad to be back with you another week as we continue uh, our weekly devotions. This week we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, uh, actually looking at the genealogy of Jesus. Um, and I want to ask you, do you ever think about where your family came from, uh, how it all started uh, for your family? I think many of us do. Uh, we have the desire to study about our past because it gives us a sense of foundation to build our lives on. Um, understanding the history of our family helps us learn more about who we are as individuals and, and why we're prone to like certain foods uh, music, um, or even why we behave the way we behave or, or say things uh, that we say. Um, you know, plus I think it's just cool to learn how you came uh, to be in the place where you are now uh, and see the bigger picture of God's plan uh, for your family. Uh, you know, there are several websites um, and DNA testing that exist these days to help us discover exactly uh, where our heritage lies. Um, I know we can, you could track our, your DNA to uh, areas of the world uh, where uh, your ethnicity uh, resides or, uh, or sits, but um, it's pretty outstanding the technology that exists uh, today with all of the databases that we have access to that we can track and see where our ancestors came from. You can even do that to get a clearer picture of the breed of your dog, uh, but that's for another day for us to talk about. But today we're going to look at the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, genealogies are important uh, for God. Uh, they're all over his word. And I think often genealogies get a bad rap in scripture, mainly because they're long passages. They contain all of the hard names um, and often just get glossed over. Uh, but a closer look reveals that there is order, uh, there is a plan, and there is specificity involved in God's plan. And namely, specifically within the passage we're going to look at today, in the incarnation of Jesus. Uh, important information to our own lives, um, and it also gives us a deeper understanding of God and, and how we fit in to his plan. So grab your copy of God's Word, and I'm going to do my best to read through uh, the genealogy of Jesus as it appears in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, we're in chapter 1. We're going to read through verses 1 through 17. So God's word says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Reboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the de deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad, and Abiad, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, 
and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So just to give you a context here, family lineage was important to Matthew's audience. Matthew was primarily writing the book, his book, to a Jewish audience. Um, that's primarily why he started with Abraham, because to the, to the Jews, all things started with Father Abraham, the, that preeminent patriarch there. They hoped in the promises that God made to their ancestors, and Matthew's goal was to show how Jesus would fulfill those promises. So beginning with Abraham, Israel's forefather, and the source of the blessing for all people, covenant relationships would be brought to the reader's mind when they heard that name, Abraham. Matthew sought to connect the fulfillment of all of these things to the coming of Jesus. But, you know, I think as we read through these names, I see just three important things for us uh, during our time this week. Number one, this is just a who's who of flawed individuals. You may recognize some of these names and some of the big names that we started off with, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Tamar, Rahab, uh, David, uh, even, all of these are flawed individuals. I mean, if you look back at these stories, Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister. He took matters into his own hands uh, with Ishmael. You know, he didn't trust God to provide that heir. So he went on and uh, convinced Sarah to allow him to, to sleep with uh, a servant um, to produce that heir. Um, Isaac kind of did the same thing. He lied about Rebecca being his sister. Um, Jacob was a deceiver. Tamar used deceit to get her rights. Rahab was uh, known as a harlot or a prostitute. And we all are familiar with David's story of being an adulterer. But here's the, the thing about these names and, and the lives of these folks. God can use anyone he chooses. He doesn't look for perfection. He seeks a willing, believing heart. There's no notoriety before God used uh, them. Before God chose them, none of these names were uh, famous. You know, he didn't see that these, well, these are already the patriarchs, um, so let's use them. People are going to know them, so let's use them. No, um, he pulled these out of seemingly nowhere um, and blessed them. Uh, I'm sure uh, there are many more names in this list that you've never heard of. The Bible is full of names like that, right? Um, the list of names uh, in the family history of Jesus is no exception. Names like Nashon or Hezron, Joram, Uzziah, uh, Ili, Iliakim, Iliakim, Azor, Iliad. Don't even know if I'm saying those right, but they're all names that are, unless you are deep into your Bible study um, and have a real strong hold on the Hebrew language, they, those names just don't roll off the tongue. Um, but each one had their own significant role in the genealogy of Christ. And you see, without Nashon, we don't make it to David. Um, without, without Iliad, we don't make it to Joseph. These were faithful men who did their part and were used of God if by just advancing the line to the next generation. 
You know, the third thing that uh, I see within this, uh, in these 17 verses is they each struggled with their own sin, uh, even after God chose them. It wasn't like God chose a bunch of liar, liars and adulterers and deceivers. Um, and then after he chose them, they stopped doing all of those things. Uh, no, I mean, these folks had uh, issues before God chose them and continued to, to struggle with their sins after God chose them. Um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David struggled with sin. Um, Abraham lied. Um, he failed to believe God would provide an heir, took matters into his own hands. Uh, that lie he told passed down to the next generation as Isaac did the same thing. Jacob deceived his father to get his brother's blessing, conned his brother out of his inheritance and continued to run from his family, all while God continued to use him. Um, and I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of David's fall. David chosen and anointed king by God committed adultery with Bathsheba. But get this, produces Solomon, the heir that continues the generational line to Jesus. God is sovereignly in control. And one of my most favorite attributes about God is that he can redeem anything for his glory. So why is all of this so important for us? You know, quite simply, this is our heritage too. You see, when we believe in Jesus, we become co-heirs with Jesus. Now, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, he, he writes this, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, uh, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself hears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We are co-heirs with Christ. So as we read through this genealogy of Jesus Christ, you know, that's our line as well. We're all part of this family of God. You know, another important aspect of, of this passage is that for uh, Matthew's audience, uh, in that culture, in the time of Jesus, adoption was considered full-on sonship. Because you notice that the genealogy Matthew gives brings us to Joseph. Um, Joseph being... Jesus's earthly adoptive father. Uh, Matthew gives us this list so we understand Jesus's legal descent, because during that time, adoption was considered full-on sonship. And as Joseph adopted Jesus into that sonship, um, it was equally as strong as a blood relationship. But what's more, our adoption into the family of God is even stronger than that because it's based on the blood of Jesus Christ. We can never be separated from the family of God. The being a part of God's family is not about being perfect before being accepted. It's about being accepted and changed as we trust God to mold us so that we reflect his glory. So a couple of questions for you as we wrap up. Are you a part of God's family? Can you read through this passage and, and, and feel the connection here? Can you trace your lineage back to that moment when you trusted in Christ's work on the cross as payment for your sins? If not, drop me an email at jhawkins at nbconline.net. I would love to connect with you and, and talk with you about how you can become part of God's family. If you have, how's your life changed? How's being a part of God's family 
changed your life? Better yet, how does your life reflect God's glory? Listen, I pray these weekly devotions are meaningful to you um, and cause you to seek God's word even more and instills in you a desire to just dive in his word every week. Until next week, you know, continue growing your faith by reading God's word. God bless you.